welcome our panelists for the Energy Transition Investment Panel, um, a.k.a. the Batteries Panel. Um, so joining me, I have Adam Best, Principal Research Scientist at CSIRO, Laura Hubbard, Managing Consultant APAC at Wood McKenzie, uh, Alex Biggs, Chief Executive Officer at Lightning Minerals, and James Gurry, Research Analyst at PAC Partners. So maybe to kick things off, do you want to each uh, give a short introduction to yourselves? So Adam, maybe start with you. Thanks very much, Amy. Uh, so Adam Best, I'm a Principal Research Scientist at CSIRO. I'm also the co-lead for our Mission and Development uh, Renewable Energy Powerhouse. Uh, my area of expertise is principally in battery technology and I've been working in that now for uh, 25 years. And that started my PhD, uh, working on solid state batteries, which are now all the rage, but at the time no one really cared about that. So I have all these zombie papers that students like to cite. Uh, but more recently it's been very much into the battery mineral value chain. And so as I described earlier, some of the work we're doing in graphite, but that's also similar into lithium, nickel, uh, and cobalt and other um, rare, uh, other critical energy metals that are part of the, the battery value chain. Great. Hi everybody, my name's Laura Hubbard. I'm a managing consultant with Wood Mackenzie in the mining and metal space. Um, I've been at Wood Mackenzie for four years, um, focusing on battery raw materials for the last two. We do projects for uh, producers and, and um, upcoming projects, both in extraction and processing. Um, we also work with uh, downstream players looking to source battery raw materials and um, governments and other organisations looking to uh, support the sector. Thank you, Laura. Um, hello, everybody. My name's Alex Biggs, Chief Executive Officer of Lightning Minerals. Um, I've been in the battery um, space now for a few years, not 25. You've made <laughs> us all look... Um, bad, but uh, that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's an emerging thematic. Um, you know, uh, Lightning Minerals, we listed end of last year. Our principal focus is lithium in the Dundas region of Western Australia. I'm also a non exec director of Metals Australia, also here um, today. Fantastic graphite project over in Canada. So, you know, I'm well entrenched in the battery space. I think it's, uh, it's very exciting. We're just at the start. You know, it's, uh, it's a thematic which I think outlives all of us. So, um, Good to be here um, and look forward to our conversation today. Thanks. Yeah, I'm James Gurry, uh, Research Analyst at, at PAC Partners, um, and my remit is to cover the critical mineral space, so very much interested in companies uh, that are uh, producing or planning to produce uh, lithium uh, and, and other critical minerals. So I'm based here in Melbourne, uh, and at PAC Partners we love working with um, small and, and medium-sized companies um, as they grow. So um, Thanks. All right, great. Um, so just to let our audience know, we will take questions throughout. So if you have a question for the panel while we go, just uh, feel free to put up your hand and somebody will bring a microphone over to you. Um, to kick things off, so thought we could talk a little bit about filling the gaps in Australia's domestic critical minerals uh, supply chain. So um, countries around the world have been talking about, you know, how how are they going to secure their own supply of these kind of key transition met metals? Uh, where do you see Australia standing uh, within this, not race to secure, but this uh, transition? Anyone who wants to start us off? Right. I'm actually going to start this by talking about Canada. Um, it's a place where I spent um, a lot of last year um, working and you know, when I look at like what Ontario is doing and the investment that they are, um, you know, putting into to mining and understanding their projects and obviously downstream and I guess they're inviting a lot of, uh, you know, manufacturers, um, you know, into the country and we're seeing um, companies establish themselves there, which makes sense. I mean, with America going through, um, you know, this second manufacturing boom, but... You know, where does that leave Australia? I guess, you know, we're somewhat isolated from that, but, uh, you know, Asia is still on the doorstep. So I think that, uh, you know, we need to see that downstream investment. Um, you know, if we look at Western Australia, which, which is where I live, um, you know, we're a minerals dependent economy, okay? By the definition, we are that. So I think there needs to be, you know, downstream, we've got obviously processing now, um, lithium um, refineries there, but I think there needs to be more than that. Um, and, you know, the same way that Geelong was a car manufacturer independent economy, okay, 
we can't go on just digging stuff out of the ground. We need to look at the next next stage, whether that be 25 years or 50 years from now. So that's my feeling. Yeah, I can definitely add to that. I think the, the government's actually getting quite active now and with the national battery strategy being developed. Uh, so the consultation phase for that obviously closed in mid-May, March. Hopefully you all put in something into that. Uh, and they're now currently writing the policy, I think, for due for release uh, later this year. So I would expect to see... Uh, quite some fanfare around that. There's a, they've also just uh, released yesterday the Powering Australia Growth Centre uh, uh, expression of interest. So the government is definitely uh, trying to focus further on downstream manufacturing. The fact that the battery strategy will be run out of the Department of Industry, Science and Resources uh, and Minister Husick's office is a strong sign that they are very keen to see more downstream activity. Uh, we at CSIRO, we're very passionate about that downstream activity. We would like to see the nation move to uh, cathode active and anode active manufacture. That's where the, the I think the, the real opportunities are for the nation is with those materials you can basically ship them anywhere in the world and under the IRA with a free trade agreement with the US we're considered domestic supply. So there are significant opportunities for Australia. Uh, it's whether we can put the right incentives, whether the right structures can be put in place that companies want to take advantage of. Just to add to that, um, I think while Australia is so uniquely placed with having um, the full suite of raw materials to go into cathode active material in particular, um, as well as the AAM, um, getting to a place where we're able to get into the downstream sector um, given the small size of the Australian market and the relatively high cost of, um, of producing manufacturing operations here in Australia, that will be the element that is holding Australia back and um, will need to be overcome to make use of um, the value add to, to Australia's raw materials. Yeah, I think, um, and, and some good examples there too. I mean, obviously, Australia used to produce a lot of steel uh, around Sydney uh, and in South Australia and elsewhere. And, you know, there were steel mills and, and modern steel proposed in, in WA. Um, so it's a, perhaps a, a good analogy of um, where Australia either was producing it or have, has tried it in the past. But really, if we can get um, absolute policy commitment and, and funding perhaps um, through these, uh, into these processing elements, then I think there's a real opportunity, yeah, to grab more of, of the value chain um, and, you know, maybe boost our population a bit with in, in bringing in a few more workers just, you know, to activate these projects and just make it easier for um, companies like Alex's to, to get up and going and, and, and wanting to, um, wanting to, yeah, add the value from not only our mining, which were obviously first class in, in these um, minerals and, and many others, but, um, yeah, to get into that processing stage. I think I'd just like to add one point to Laura's comment. I don't... If we make cathode active and anode active materials the same way the Chinese do, we'll lose, flat out. We have to innovate around these processes. We need to think about how we can be less energy intensive, how we can be less labour intensive, how can we automate these processes, how can we bring renewable energy to these processes to take energy intensity out. If we can do these things, if we can play smarter, then I think we can be quite successful. But if we try and do exactly what's done in China, we will absolutely lose. So we need to think outside the square, bring innovation and thought to these, pro these problems, and I think we can be very successful. But definitely have to change the game to suit ourselves. And I guess the irony there is that, you know, there's a lot of fantastic universities in this country um, and I see a lot of PhD people going overseas mm. to pursue that. And I think having, having the brains here, that's probably the biggest thing, right? I mean, the government needs to step up with policy and support that though. So, yep, agree. Um, so you mentioned the, uh, the national battery strategy in the IRA. Um, out of the U.S. So how are these types of government initiatives, um, government-driven initiatives, how are they creating opportunities in the mining investment space? Um, and how do you see these policies likely to change the market in the long term? I think we are beginning to see the shift um, with the new policies from, from the states um, in development and from, from Europe. Um, these sectors for the, the battery 
market are still very low at the moment, um, but the, the US is expected to um, have 40% of global demand for EVs by, by 2030, according to Wood Mackenzie. And so uh, the importance of these policies um, and the, the volume of, of raw materials that we'll need to um, comply with them will be growing over the next decade. Um, so while the IRA in particular is very much still in development, um, we see that it, it will have a big impact on, on where um, we will be sourcing or battery makers will be sourcing raw materials from and begin to kind of shift um, which, which projects and, and which um, producers sort of have that um, oversubscribed demand um, in order to, to get a hold of those products. I think you can also see um, Europe's also responding quite strongly as well. So they've obviously been quite active in engaging with the US to be able to get their, their supply recognised because they were immediately seeing once IRA was instituted, there was huge outflow straight out of Europe. So there, there will be some changes there, I think, as that kind of rebalances. Interestingly, I think for Australia, I think part of the, our challenges will be regulatory compliance uh, particularly where, uh, particularly if the Europeans apply carbon adjustment taxes at the border, we will need to be producing low carbon mineral products. If we don't do that, there will be adjustments made at the border which may make our products uncompetitive. So again, innovation will come to the fore. How can we innovate in these markets? How can we develop new processes which will maintain our competitiveness? I think will be quite critical. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, if we look at America, I mean, it's, uh, I believe it's going through this second manufacturing boom and, you know, I guess, it, it, you know, as a, as a view for them to decouple from China, right? And, um, you know, maybe that's the elephant in the room, but that's what America wants to happen, let's be honest. So how do we um, become part of that when China is obviously um, a very close ally of ours, particularly when it comes to the resources space? Um, how do we get a part of that pie? Um, I guess with the states, you know, they have got Canada on their border. They have got that supply opportunity there. Um, all these policies, you know, I think they're, they're fantastic, but, you know, we need to see action. It needs to happen. Um, you know, we need to see the flow-on effect, not just at one point in the chain, but at multiple points in the chain. And, you know, as we've said, like, this industry is so young. I mean, we're at the start. It's, um, you know, it's got a long way to go, so... Um, but, you know, I'd rather have these policies in, in place than not, but, um, you know, I would like to see the Australian government probably being a little bit more aggressive um, in looking at innovation, for example, and how we set ourselves um, aside as opposed to just being a, you know, a manufacturer only. Because I think um, you see it in the media today, like no one wants to out particularly if you're a producer or someone with a project, no one wants to go out there and say, I was absolutely disappointed with the Australian, um, with the budget that was handed down recently or um, the level of, um, yeah, sort of tiptoeing around. And, and I think it's in the media this morning that we're going to have um, a department um, of, of the federal government engaged with a department um, of, the, um, of the US government um, to help companies coordinate all this stuff and it sounded very indirect, it sounded very, um, uh, a little bit confusing for me um, compared to those companies that you can see in other jurisdictions that are going straight ahead, um, repositioning themselves and you can see all these um, battery manufacturers absolutely pivoting to the US, to Canada, to Brazil or to Mexico where they think, right, I'm, I'm going to be able to take advantage of this straight away, I'm going to set up my plant here. Um, more often than not, we're, we've got to be located where the resources are uh, and so it's going to be a bit more of a challenge and a bit more of a second derivative. Um, and so we need that to be addressed, I think, um, either through um, loans or, or, or whatever, um, even if we're not paying taxes in the US. Yeah. I feel like there's been a lot of announcements out of the uh, Australian government about, um, you know, critical materials... Uh, Project, you know, programs and stuff to, to help encourage the industry here. Have you seen any proper follow through following those um, those announcements? I think I can just speak from the research side. So um, CSIRO is together with uh, uh, Geoscience Australia and ANSTO. We're part of the uh, Virtual Critical Minerals Research Hub, 
which is specifically looking at critical minerals processing, and that's led by uh, my colleague Chris Vernon at Minute in Renewables Resources in CSIRO. And uh, the, half the money for that's already been dished out, and I believe there'll be a second tranche of grants uh, coming out shortly. Uh, the Critical Minerals Office has just been given additional funding through this current budget round, so there is quite an amount of money there. In terms of where I think the money needs to be is probably in downstream projects, uh, and, and this is where the money is going in the IRA, is to help actually build these downstream production facilities. Uh, I don't think we have a challenge in terms of mining. I think we, we can do that pretty well. It's what happens in that downstream processing and how do we open those opportunities? How do we build and grow companies in that space, I think, is where the opportunities lie. Uh, I think that's where probably a bit more activity needs to happen. I think also we need to see um, support on the ground. I'll talk about Ontario. I've mentioned Canada a lot, I know. I'm not, I'm not Canadian, by the way. But, I am. Um, I am? <laughs> Congratulations. Um, no, so, look, I mean, looking at Ontario, when we were working over there, the geological survey was actually sent out to our site, and they came out, and they were doing all this work, and it's not costing us anything as a business, right? They were mandated by the government um, to go around, look at these projects, and I guess the idea being that, you know, rank these projects as likelihood of um, being developed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Government could then ring fence those, work out what the infrastructure would look like in certain regions. So that, I mean, is 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 really proactive and um, you know on the ground work. And I'd like to see that sort of stuff happening um, here in Australia. Um, you know, the government being directly involved in, in supporting that development, as you said, um, but probably even before that, um, just so we understand what, uh, you know, what that infrastru those infrastructure requirements might be moving forward, because ultimately that's going to be the thing that's going to hold all this up, okay? And you can see the best example is probably Iluka's rare earth refinery in, in, in Niaba, and they've got, is it over a $1 billion loan um, from from the government. Um, Iluk is a pretty big company already. They've got a lot of financial resources already. It would be terrific just to see um, more and more support for, for medium-sized and, and smaller-sized companies with um, perhaps bigger ambitions relative to their current size um, at the moment. I think um, one other example where we're talking about um, sort of government support in uh, Finland, uh, there is a, a government-funded organisation that is, is working and partnering with private organisations, um, it's called FMG, to set up um, precursor and, and CAM facilities um, in order to sort of establish that, that value chain um, domestically. And so I can see that having um, that government support is very important, but um, another way to, to channel that funding is to, um, is to invest directly uh, and work with companies from overseas with experience in these, these sectors um, and their expertise in, in producing these products cheaply um, to, to bring them in-house and, and work on that downstream manufacturing. Um, looking more at kind of the, the idea of, uh, you know, regionalising or nationalising uh, these critical mineral supply chains, um, I guess I just wanted to know what are your thoughts on kind of the, the the transition that's happened in terms of um, you know that that move away from this deglobalization um, as it's been called in terms of the supply chains. You have seen um, some companies that have had certain shareholders um, have to ask those shareholders to divest themselves of the shareholdings. Um, it's also happened obviously in Canada, but here um, particularly you see it if you're trying to sign up. Um, a battery customer who is um, adamantly um, outside of China and they're trying to stay outside of China and not have those connections and therefore um, if you're a mining company and you've got um, a big Chinese shareholder it does make it a little bit awkward so I think we have seen at the edges those that are at the crunch point who really are trying to either sign up customers or put their project finance in place they have had to make significant moves or um, compromises to, uh, to readjust um, the way they're set up from a corporate point of view um, to, to cater to this new um, critical minerals yeah, supply chain channeling. Yeah. 
I think we're seeing um, a lot of protectionist type policies um, in various countries around the world. And, you know, I thought we were a free market economy globally now. So, you know, we've headed towards globalisation, which um, apparently now might be a problem for um, a lot of countries um, in individually. Now, that comes down to underinvestment in these industries. That's why, right? And uh, we, we've seen that. So, you know, I mean, uh, the, there's a comment that, you know, you can't really make change in a democracy. And if we look at China, we see, um, obviously, you know, the antithesis of that. I don't necessarily believe in either, but I think that these protectionist policies, um, I don't think they necessarily um, help the thematic long term, um, unless, of course, you've got a solution which you can roll out very quickly over the next few years. And if you can't do that, I think people are going to shoot themselves in the foot. Because uh, when you do your model, economics wins, um, you know, most of the time, right? So unless you have, yeah, some real big tax incentives up front that really change the economics for a corporate to look at a particular project or, or processing plant or whatever, that's really what you need to win. Uh, and it does get a little bit awkward when you do start subsidising certain industries if you are trying to be... Um, um, you know, fair trade, global, you know, um, equal playing field. But, you know, we've identified and, and Europe most <coughs> recently has been looking at just the need to diversify from a security point of view, the sources of supply. Yeah. I think from our, my perspective, localization has seen us uh, as an organisation see a lot more research being done with us now. People are asking us to help them with um, uh, mining uh, activities, to help them with probably things that they would not have looked at previously. It may not have been made economic sense, but because of the localization approach, all of a sudden they're saying, well, maybe this makes sense now. Maybe we can do things here which may not have made economic sense previously. And this is all around that, uh, making sure you have all these national resources. So this is where things like DLE, uh, direct lithium extraction, is all of a sudden becoming a red hot topic. In some places, there are DLE activities going on on lithium resources, which Five years ago, you wouldn't have even looked twice at. But now, all of a sudden, they're, they're now being actively looked at. But in some instances, the technology is still not there or optimum enough to actually develop uh, those products. So there's still a lot more work that's going to have to be done to make sure that those are able to be efficiently recovered. Okay. Do we have any questions from the audience before we kind of continue on? All right. If not, um, want to kind of change... Oh, we do right there. Sorry, can we get a microphone? Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion about kind of downstream development in the supply chain. I think we've all clearly identified there's there's a lot of barriers that need to be overcome, whether it's whether it's development through innovation, and then there's a lot of money coming from the federal government um, to projects kind of throughout the supply chain. Is that the best placement of of that funding um, into pre-feasibility studies for projects that are a long way from from actually hitting the market? Um, is it better to look at ways to subsidise some of those key barriers, whether it's labour costs or energy costs, which really are what's stopping any major downstream development? Or is it that really we should focus on what we're really good at, which is mining um, and kind of initial processing, um, benefit from some of these new policy drivers such as the IRA and the CRMA in Europe, um, and, and focus on that for now rather than trying to go too far downstream into, a, into an area that's very competitive and that there's huge barriers to entry. I had some discussions in uh, Perth with some people in the Liberal Party. Amazingly, they do actually still exist there. There's one or two <laughs> um, Liberal Party people floating around. But uh, it was exactly this conversation, um, the question you asked. And I think that, you know, the barriers to entry, and if you asked a lot of people, they would say, it's labour costs, it's power costs. OK, fine subsidise that somehow with manufacturers who want to come here. That then drives the government to solve that problem long term. Now, we're looking at green energy as a solution. You're actually investing in the thing that's going to solve your power problem long term. OK, labour costs. OK, that's always going to be, you know, an issue. But um, I think that's where it needs to be. It needs to be looked at because I think if you can if you can give, if you can give, um, you know, provide that downstream here, you know, so we're not just a, a primary producer, you know, we're an innovator. 
we're a manufacturer, you know, and I'm not saying we compete on scale with, um, you know, China or anyone like that, but I think that's where the innovation bit is so important. Um, but I believe that's where the government should be looking, um, solving those problems. I'd agree. Um, I do agree with the challenges that you've addressed there, Harry. But I think we've had we've been we've had dumb luck twice. Uh, the iron ore boom, and we're shipping iron ore, and we're we can do that cheaper than someone was telling me. We're cheaper than you can get Yoruba eats now per ton. But is that really maximising what we can do as a nation? Are we are we uh, are we maximising the, 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 the level of investment we have in education, universities and the like? Are there things we can do to actually start to leverage that and then develop downstream things? It will take time, but if we don't start somewhere, we're, we're going to doom ourselves to the same. We won't get lucky four times. I, can't, I just can't see it. We've had oil and gas, now we've had iron ore, uh, battery materials. You know, I don't see what comes after that. So we we have to make the most of this we have to we have to put in place policies and plans that allow us to maximize the opportunity that we've got here because I, I i don't see where the next one comes from i think um in order to take advantage of those sort of localization um drives that are happening at the moment um Australia will need to either um, do some refining to battery chemicals or, or partner with um, ex-China operators such as those in Korea to um, create those value chains that um, pass, pass the IRA threshold, um, which has got to be 50% of the product value. Um, sort of mining to, to spodumene, for example, won't, won't get um, that product over the line. Um, so either processing that, that bit further, as we're beginning to see here in Australia, or, um, or managing that um, through those partnerships will be needed to, um, to, to have these products um, have that additional value of, um, of being um, ESG friendly and, and sort of um, friendshoring friendly. All right. Any other questions from the audience before we move on? Um, so I want to look specifically at different battery metals, copper, nickel, lithium, et cetera. Uh, where do you see kind of the smart investment money going right now? Who wants to? <laughs> I feel like if I go first, because I'm CEO <laughs> of Lightning Minerals, I might be asking you to invest. But um, no, look, um, lithium... You know, as we said at the start, it's a it's a it's a thematic that's going to outlive us. And if you believe it, right, right, that's the big question. But I'll I'll put it like this: if as a company you came out and you said oh, we've got investment or support from the Australian government or the U.S. government, what's going to happen to your share price? You know, it's only going to go one way. But that's the situation we're actually all in. We're all in that situation right now. So. You know, I think anything related to this change and this policy-driven change and all these green mandates and all these green targets and I think Australia's targets are 2070, so a long way in the future. Um, you know, anything connected to that I think is, um, is strong, um, you know, and I, and I can't see that changing unless, of course, in 20 years' time all the governments get together and go, oh, that was too hard, wasn't it? Let's um, go and mine some more coal. So, uh, but I don't think that will happen. I think um, I think this thematic is here to stay. It's deep. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in it, and um, it's backed by um, all the major players and governments. I think sometimes you have to tread carefully because um, China does dominate the production of many, by definition, these critical minerals. And so, if you shout from the rooftops, there's always the um, the, ch the chance that you get a knee-jerk reaction from China um, in terms of restricting exports and I don't think you, you do want to do that but quietly I think we have seen a huge amount of recent appetite for rare earths exploration and discoveries um, they really seem to be um, in the news lately I mean lithium's obviously um, been in the sweet spot now for three or four years I think um, yeah graphite has still got a way ahead um, it's not particularly scarce, but there's some terrific um, ore bodies being uncovered right now in, in other countries. 
So um, I think, yeah, some of the smart money is, is edging ahead in, in other commodities as well as, um, you know, the overwhelming amount of lithium that we still do need. Um, you know, we can supply it from this country and, and other countries, yeah. Um, I think across all of these critical minerals, we are expecting to see long-term um, supply, structural supply deficits. Uh, so there is, is potential across the board. Um, but one thing that we're seeing, and we've seen the last couple of years, and at, at Wood Mackenzie we expect to continue to see, is this volatility as these markets in many cases um, double or, or triple in size and the supply shocks um, and, and changes in expected demand uh, leading to this this price volatility. So I think um, an important investment um, thing to keep in mind is is just that we we expect this to continue and and but the demand is expected to be there. So um, so writing that out and sort of uh, thinking about these smartly, whether they are in or out of fashion that that month or year, um, will be the the way to to get through this successfully. So I think you need to see the customer and the and the miner come closer and closer together because it, it is very hard for people to plan projects through the absolute price volatility or often it's just price discovery in commodities you've never heard of or um, things like that. So um, either you know there's a small amount of customers who are often downstream processes who actually turn it into to magnets or specific things that you actually need and there's only you know a handful of those um, processing plants in the world so there's a bit of a c condensedness of um, of the of the whole value chain um, so that you can get more you obviously see it in the automakers but yeah sponsoring mines sponsoring yeah primary producers so that you can traverse that that volatility and give them the security they need to lock in funding and know that they're going to have a, a viable economic um, product, you know, when it, because you don't know where inflation is going to end up and, and all our costs of production. But if you have a, a sponsor, customer, as well as government support, I think, yeah, you need a cohesive approach to it. Um, you talk a little bit about like the miner and the customer coming together. Um, you know, there's been a lot in the news about um, some of the OEMs, the auto OEMs, kind of getting involved right with the mining companies. Uh, do you see that continuing? How do you see that impacting the market overall? I think that vertical integration is, um, as far as the OEMs go, it's their fantasy, but it's not their reality. Like, you know, we'd love to think that we have a mine. I mean, this is very old-fashioned, right? If you go back to the Industrial Revolution, like, that's, that's how it was. You had, a, you had a, a coal mine, you had a power station, or you had, a, you know, you had everything close. Um, and I still think that, that they think that's viable. I don't think that is viable. We'll see it in, um, um, you know, as you said, James, certain, you know, specific and, and very specialist areas, but... You know, I do believe that uh, the vertical integration across the whole mining, and not just mining, we're talking about maybe discovering projects and developing projects, mining projects, all the way through. I don't think it's efficient. I don't think it's effective. They like it because they believe it secures their supply at a certain price. Mm -hmm. But if they can't mine it as efficiently as a free market can mine it, like we can, and we're judged by our shareholders, then I think that that potentially runs away with itself very quickly and all of a sudden it's a millstone around their neck. I think it, there's definitely been a number of meetings I've been to recently. I think that Tesla has said it's going to become a nickel refiner. It wants to be a lithium miner. It wants to be everything at, at the moment. Uh, and they have armies of people looking at all of this stuff now by, by all accounts. So again, I, I'd agree. I don't, I don't think that's their business. I think they're, they're an automaker at the end of the day. So it's going to be very difficult, I think, for them to, to, to be able to make the innovation and, uh, and, and make that efficient and effective for themselves. Uh, I think it, they're very good at driving manufacturing, but mining's a whole different game. I, I, I don't think they appreciate the challenge, to be honest. I think for the most part what we've been seeing while, while looking at this, this trend and, and at battery makers and OEMs looking to strategically source battery raw materials is that most of them are, are not interested in becoming miners um, because they, they know that it's not their area of expertise. Um, but there has been a lot of interest in either 
strategically sourcing over the long term and setting up those offtake agreements or um, making investments um, often to get a hold of those offtake agreements. So I think that investment will continue. Obviously, last year there was um, it was a bit of a gold rush to, to get a hold of those assets and that supply. Um, I think we will see it continue in, in a more um, calm fashion. Uh, and there is so much interest from, from that downstream sector as well as other parties. Um, and we'll see that continue on. Uh, we have a question from the audience up in the front. This is to Laura. What's your understanding with the Inflation Reduction Act? And how will that pan out in the next five years? What level of clarity do the government or the industry have as of now? Okay, um, yeah, we've definitely been, been looking at that at Wood Mackenzie. Um, the information is still quite, quite sparse and still developing. Um, there was a, a release from the Treasury at the end of April that provided a little bit more information about how the calculation of, um, of critical mineral qualification might work um, with that 50% threshold of, um, of value add in order to qualify. Um, however, I think there will be plenty more information still to come out and the policy will be refined over time. Um, at the moment, it's only 40% of um, critical minerals need to, to sort of pass in order for um, an EV to, to get the, that half of the tax credit. There's also this other element um, which is not yet in play of um, excluded countries. I've forgotten the exact terminology. Foreign entities of concern, um, which, which has not officially yet been released, but um, we, we can speculate about which countries might be on that list. And um, obviously when, when that element comes into play with um, the refining of, of all of our battery raw materials, potentially you could have not many EVs qualifying. So I think there's a lot of evolution still to come in this policy. Um, and it is, is pushing um, battery makers and, and OEMs to, to plan differently. That being said, um, this is a $7,500 tax credit. Um, Tesla... Previous, under the previous EV tax credit, um, some of their vehicles weren't qualifying and they were still growing at pace. So this is an important policy and everybody is taking notice, but it is not the be-all and end-all. There are some pretty big loopholes. Um, so I think well, I was in the US in April and at that point when the, the first um, advice came out, there was also an announcement by Ford that they had made an investment in Indonesia and everyone went scratching their head like, why are you doing that? Well, it turns out if Ford sells the vehicle to Ford Credit as a lease vehicle, then they can actually get the tax credit. The lease or can get that tax credit. Whereas if you're Joe Average, turn up at the dealer and buys a car with Indonesian nickel in it, you won't get the tax credit. So there are all sorts of weird and wonderful um, holes in this policy that they can't undo either, by the way, because of the, the, the split between the House of Representatives and Congress. So that there's no do-overs here. So the holes will be the holes. Uh, and so you will find ways, the automakers will find ways to get around this, I'm almost certain of it. Yeah, and I think in addition, we're still seeing um, countries doing uh, critical mineral-specific deals with the US, like uh, in Korea and, and potentially um, the EU, Indonesia, down the track, that might open up the range of countries that, that do qualify. Anything else from the audience before we start to wrap things up? Um, so we we titled this uh, this session the energy transition, and uh, we've talked quite a bit about batteries, but um, I wanted to maybe just touch on some more kind of sustainability moves to net zero type of um, type of topic. Um, you know, what are some some of the moves that the industry is making to kind of um, enable that transition, whether it's, uh, you know, looking at recycling or moves to net zero mining, um, you know, w what are some ways that the industry is really kind of pushing ahead with this? 
I can maybe start. So we don't call it a transition at CSIRO. We call it a transformation. This is single biggest energy change we're seeing. And if you, depending on who you talk to, you know, this has to be done in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And if you think about how energy has evolved over the last 50 or 100 years, this, this is a massive change in what, 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 we're, what we're trying to do globally. So the, and the, cha- and the, the pace of change is, is going to be rapid as well. So many companies are extraordinarily active and have seen probably seen much of this coming before even the government has. I think the, it's really the change of government here in Australia that saw, has seen a major change in, in how they're responding in terms of some of the policy developments that are coming. So I think companies already recognise from consumers that they want to see high levels of ESG in their products. They want to see greater levels of sustainability. Company customers are savvy to this stuff. They're not. They're not. Um, they're not silly about it. So I think you'll see people being really aware of where their minerals come from. The people probably want to even see how much recycled content will be in their batteries in the future. Uh, people want to know that they can charge their car using renewable energy. There's enough articles around that say if you have an electric vehicle charged off a coal-fired power station, it's nowhere near as sustainable if it's charged off renewable energy. If anything, it's, it's going to be how do we ensure that there's equity in all of this because there are going to be people left behind. And there was an article last week, First Nations people are already saying, you know, how do we access renewable energy? How do we make sure we can take advantage of the, of the opportunities in the clean energy economy? So there's lots more to be done. I think companies are aware of it, but I still think there are th- better thing, th- things we can do better to be able to make sure that we can all access the opportunities that a clean energy future has for us. Yeah, I think most uh, most operate in miners right now. I mean, they all have a, a strong focus on ESG. I mean, the irony of the uh, the revolution or whatever you want to call it, transition, um, is that we're still digging holes in the ground, people, you know? Um, and there is a sustainable way of doing that too. So, you know, I think if you look at all the big miners or operate in miners, they all have a focus on ESG, you know? Um, a lot of my friends um, who still work in the industry on the operational side, they're looking at electric trucks, they're looking at electric vehicles. These are being tried, these are being trialled out. We've got remote operating centres now for, you know, um, haulage and stuff up in the Pilbara. You know, those vehicles are operated from Perth, right? You know, there's a there's an E and an S just in that alone, okay? So, you know, I think that they're definitely trying, and I agree with your comment that I think they were somewhat ahead of, um, of the government, and I think that was generally down to uh, the poor image um, that mining has. Even in Perth, you know, where we're, we're, so, we're so mining heavy, um, you know, it still has that. So I think that's, that sentiment has driven people um, to do the right thing, I think, as a whole, we do anyway. But um, there is still a lot of change to come, for sure. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, we've got one here in the middle. Yeah, talk loudly. I was just going to say, Ned, as you all mentioned, demand for battery raw materials, you know, is only increasing. Australia's uniquely placed in terms of supply that we have been blessed in terms of resources. But there's still, despite government, you know, you've got, but there's still the community backlash in terms of there's a lot of general population don't want money in their backyard, and there's still that anti mining sentiment. What do you guys think the government could do or others do to try and get? The general population understanding that we will need to mine these battery raw materials to enable the energy transition or revolution in the future. I can speak from CSIRO's perspective. So we we actually have um, a, a couple of programs to actually address some of these social license opportunities. So one of them is called the Responsible Innovation Future Science Pro- Platform, and we actually have teams of people now looking at how do we engage communities better to understand uh, the challenges of mining, particularly First Nations people, because they generally have the land where a lot of these minerals are, so how do we engage with those those people to understand what are the cultural sensitivities around mining on their land? Uh, this is a similar problem globally. 
In the US, in fact, the US is looking at Australia saying, well, hang on, how do you guys do it? And we're kind of muddling through. So this is, this is I think, in a really evolving area, particularly with the amount of mining we're going to need to do in, in the future. So we're, we're actively looking at, well, what are the issues and how are we going to address them? Because everyone wants renewable energy, but as you say, no one wants it in their backyard. So the question is, how do we... How do we ensure social acceptance? How do we also make sure that there's social equity around this? Because there will be groups of people who will be far more influenced than others. Like people in Melbourne aren't going to suffer mining versus people who live out in uh, community re regional and remote areas. So these are, these are questions that still need a lot of work to be done. Can I just highlight, um, in, in my looking at the space, I've been amazed actually, in these critical minerals, often we used to mine them. Um, back, you know, 100 years ago or 50 years ago, but you know, due to economics, um, the, you know, the whole thing just went over to one jurisdiction, and, and they now dominate 90 or 80 percent. So there is uh, some low-hanging fruit out there in a, quite a number of instances where um, you're seeing the reactivation of a mine um, that shut in the 1980s or the 1990s. Uh, seeing that in a, in a number of instances, and often or there is uh, a town next to that mine and that town exists because the mine was operating from 1900 through to 1980 or something like that. So you can see that on King Island, um, you can see it in some places in Queensland. Um, I've seen it in Brazil where they've been doing small scale lithium mining for years and years. Uh, and so they're just expanding existing operations. So I think from a community relations perspective, it's no doubt it's one of the biggest challenges, uh, and particularly if you've got a greenfield operation. But um, in these critical minerals, sometimes there is a lot of opportunity to redevelop something that, that used to be there, and you've got a community that is inherently, you know, their dad used to work there or their uncle used to work there and they actually welcome the reactivation of, of mining in their community. So I think that's a, a great thing to perhaps tap into more and more if we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to have to put a halt on us there because we are kind of up for time. But thank you to our panel. So Adam, Alex, James and Laura for joining me here today.